Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am Emily Paisner, and I am the head of marketing for Daybreak Health. I'll be moderating the panel discussion today. Um, for those of you who may not know Daybreak, um, we partner with school districts across the country to provide personalized mental health support to help each student reach their full potential. We're the leading school-based teletherapy provider, and our programs are designed to give students equal access to high-quality, affordable, and culturally competent care to meet each of their unique needs. Today, you'll see we have th three very incredible panelists with us today um, to discuss school-based mental health as we start, or we have started, another academic year with soaring rates of anxiety, depression, trauma, and so much more. Uh, before I hand it over to uh, our panelists to introduce themselves, I want to let you all know that we will be sharing a recording of the webinar in the next few days. And if you have any questions at all for our panelists throughout the webinar, please put them in the Q&A section and we will make sure to um, leave time at the end to answer as many questions as we can. So I'm going to hand it over to our panelists. Jillian, let's start with you. Hi everyone, my name is Jillian Kelton. I'm the Chief of Student Support for Boston Public Schools. Um, in my role, I oversee the departments of social work, health services, athletics, our counseling intervention center, restorative justice, student attendance, students experiencing homelessness and youth leadership. Um, prior to that, I was the Assistant Director of Safety Services for the district. Um, helping to support marginalized youth. And prior to that, I was school-based in Boston at one of our public six to 12 schools um, for 14 years as a school counselor and as a school administrator. Really happy to be here. Thank you so much, Jillian. Ernest, over to you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, uh, everyone. I uh, hope you all are doing well. I am um, an educational consultant. Um, I also serve as a, a board member for a private school in Charlotte. Um, and uh, I have nearly two decades of uh, public education experience, including uh, as a classroom teacher, English teacher, uh, chief of staff, as well as uh, superintendent of schools. And uh, in that uh, capacity as superintendent of schools, um, I oversaw uh, the day-to-day -day operations uh, for uh, the country's 17th largest school district. Uh, we have over 140,000 students, uh, 20,000 staff members. Uh, I am also a product of public schools myself in Chicago. My wife and I, we have two daughters, a high schooler and a middle school. Uh, and so this issue, uh, around youth mental health is uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, I believe it's important to support um, the mental health needs of our young people uh, because it helps them to live a happier, uh, healthier, uh, more productive and fulfilling life, which I think uh, when all is said and done, that uh, benefits society as a whole. Um, glad to be here as well. Thank you so much. Juan? Yes, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Juan Trevino. I'm the National Clinical Director at Daybreak Health and incredibly humbled to be joined by uh, the other panelists today. Uh, my background is really in school-based social work. I'm an LCSW and I started my career really working with students that come from neurodiverse populations and building programming so that they could uh, uh, truly access an educational model. Uh, from there, I went into supporting schools uh, in with working with emotionally disturbed students, uh, building programming and had the good fortune of, uh, of as things shifted and, and funding shifted, how Californians delivered uh, mental health services to students. So being on that with that background and serving students, uh, that led me to managing a program that was truly built for uh, meeting the emotional needs of students. And, and really, it got my thinking about how we can do that at a larger scale for all students and not just students with IEPs or students uh, with special needs. So it kind of led me to this other world of social emotional learning and curriculum and what that really means and how we can support students across the board as they attend schools uh, with things like decision making and regulating their emotions and and really understanding how they are, how they're feeling, and what we can do as, uh, as faculty members, as teachers, administrators, and counselors to ensure that we support these students. 
And that's truly what brought me to Daybreak to build the kind of programs that really can uh, uh, demonstrate not only effective interventions for students, but help support schools uh, to identify a student need and, uh, and provide interventions that really interventions and resources that can be utilized by everybody. So again, incredibly humbled to be here with the, the other panelists and um, yeah, I look forward to the questions. Thank you so much, Juan. Um, Jillian, I would love to start with you. Um, there's a new school year upon us, and I would love to hear from you what is top of mind for Boston Public Schools when it comes to student mental health, and you know what, exi what existing systems of support do you have in place, and how are you looking to expand those systems of support um, throughout this school year? So, I think the first thing we're really looking at in Boston is how are our students coming back to us? Um, you know, what are our way of doing tier one check-ins with all of our students um, and immediately being able to build bridges to parents and families as well? Um, we have always and will always continue to emphasize the importance of relationship building. It's also important to remember that a lot can happen in a summer that can shift a young person's life. So we have to create the space within our schools for meaningful connection to happen in every classroom every day that will allow our young people to be able to show or ask when they need help, um, allow them the space to advocate for themselves. Um, and we need to know our students. We can't serve or help our students or support our students if we don't know them. So in every building, we really are emphasizing that every student needs to be accounted for. And some adult in that building needs to be able to tell me or somebody else about that student. Um, it's about creating the right climate for mental health check-ins to happen. Um, so, you know, any student on a roster in a school, somebody in that building, an adult, should be able to tell me some sort of background about that young person. Um, and in order to create that climate, um, we can't forget about the adults, the staff in the building. Um, we need to revisit the ways in which we're creating restorative learning environments that allow for check-ins around how students are doing um, and how that can be interwoven into curriculum and teaching and learning goals. Staff need to feel that they're able to do this and that they have support with this. Um, we're increasing our support around this in Boston Public. Um, we are creating positions, uh, restorative practices positions that we created over the summer that will help to build the climate where true connection can happen for teachers. Um, we understand that this, a lot of times, um, the increase in mental health needs of our young people comes out in classrooms and our teachers aren't necessarily trained um, to identify this and to support it at a tier one level. So allowing and giving teachers um, the toolkits to do that is really important. So providing professional development for them to do that is also critical. Um, and we need to continue to build bridges to both community and family. Um, education and what schools are being asked to do has to extend beyond the walls of the school building. Um, we have to create open lines of communication with community partners and with families. Um, so those are some of the things that we're really focusing on as our students are coming back to us in these first few weeks. So incredibly important. And you touched on staff mental health, and I want to come back to that in a little bit, because um, as one of the uh, people joining us said that uh, the workload that they felt in the past three years, the workload felt like three years in one last year. Um, and so, you know, teachers are really, uh, and, and, and school uh, mental health professionals are, have really, you know, had a hard time as well. Um, Juan, you are on the front lines talking to kids every day, um, you and the clinical team here at Daybreak. Um, what are you hearing the most from kids right now? And are these challenges that you've heard about over the last several years or have, do you think or have new ones surfaced? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a really good question. And, and so we're hearing a lot of similar issues, I think, that have been going on for years. But one of the things I think that's, that's changed quite a bit is the amount of stressors that students are dealing with and those stressors being heightened by, by the pandemic, um, particularly uh, around school avoidance. So the big ones I'm hearing from um, our clinicians is anxiety, school avoidance academic struggles, um, relationship issues. These are big reasons why uh, students often will be referred to Daybreak or what I'm hearing from clinicians uh, that are working with students. But more importantly, I think that 
these these symptoms that often we talk about. And Jillian, I love what you said. You know, th- this idea that that teachers and people working with students need to be able to identify these things. I think they're often they're on the front lines. They're amazing at identifying these changes. So we really notice the symptoms happening for students. However, it's a matter of the tools that we provide them with, right? And 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 that's why I, I love the work with Daybreak because we have over a hundred clinicians that can help provide students with the tools that they need. However, the first people that they go to are often, or the first people that notice are the teachers, are the people that that have dedicated their lives to working with children, are the administrators, are the the school counselors, right? And then you know, when you think about Ernest's role of being the administrator that then provides those teachers and uh, with the resources that they need, uh, programs like Daybreak that really specialize in working with different mental health issues, ultimately we're able to provide the kinds of interventions. And so we have seen an increase, Emily, I would say in the stressors. And I love this definition of stressors. It's our resistance to what's actually happening, right? And so why are students being resistant and in many cases, they're resistant because they lack the tools that they might need in order to deal with that stressor. If it's, you know, I think of things being built in, simple things like that teachers already do, like organization, talking about organization. Let's get you organized. When I'm organized, I feel more equipped to deal with that stressor of, gosh, school's hard. Oh, my gosh. And, and you know, when you think about stressors, are they different? When when I was in school and yes, it was what it feels like forever ago, you had to be organized in a binder. Now you have to be organized digitally with your digital folders, your Google Classrooms, et cetera, in addition to some other things. So I think an increase in stressors is kind of a sign of the times in many ways, but also the stressors that increased, economic stressors. You know, we think about ACEs scores or these adverse childhood experiences. These things have been elevated However, when we can identify them early, utilizing our school staff that work with these students, we can provide students and teachers with the kinds of resources and tools that can truly help address uh, what we're facing in school. So at Daybreak, we love to partner with schools in order to provide those kinds of things. And, and, and we're confident in the, you know, the, the resources we have with 10 different languages and you know, supporting BIPOC youth and, and, and really able to dig in and face the challenges that, uh, that our kids are facing. So love partnering with folks like Jillian to, to do that. Before we move on, Juan, um, you and Jillian both talked about the importance of teachers, um, you know, be, knowing these kiddos um, the best. And so, but they're not trained in this, right? They have a lot of other demands on them. So how can, you know, teachers and other um, staff in the school really help to support kids, especially during this transition from summer in, you know, back to school? I, I think, Jillian, and, and I'd love if you want to uh, go off of this point, too, because I think you nailed it. It's truly, you know, when when you're on campus, you feel like, I, well, I want to help. But also recognizing that sometimes the best way you can help is by having a great referral source. It's not necessarily a, a teacher, a coach is, or even, you know, sometimes other other people in the community, it's not necessarily your job, but when you have the tools that you need to provide that student, you know, if someone asked me to help, you know, fix a door, which if you've ever hung a door, it's quite difficult. Uh, however, I might not be the person, but you could point me in the right direction of how to help with. So having the right resources is incredibly important and knowing who to refer to in those cases. But it starts with, and Jillian said it, the relationship. By knowing that child, I have the ability to truly ask, what's going on? And I might not, but I know someone who can help. I know this Mr. Trevino guy. He can absolutely help you with this. Let me make the introduction. And so I think that's uh, that's it. And Jillian, if you want to speak to that a little bit, because I kind of piggybacked on your point. Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, understanding our capacity in schools with our school-based personnel um, and strengthening our relationships with community-based organizations, um, with community health centers. You know, I, for years, was a school guidance counselor. And really, you know, this has been written about before, but the the role of the school guidance counselor is should be viewed sort of as, as a primary care physician, right? So you come in and you understand, you know, you sort of see what the needs are of the student, and then you refer out to the specialist, 
right? Um, so I think we need to start thinking about the mental health needs of our students in that way. We can provide tier one and tier two supports for our students. Um, and certainly our classroom teachers can do some tier one supports, daily check-ins, writing prompts that allow for things to be shared, um, but then knowing when to refer out, right, to the specialist. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, Emily, if I, the only thing I would add to that too, Jillian, is this idea of like, when you get that that tier three intervention and, and therapy, and I think there's this there's this stigma around like, well, therapy means I have this mental health disorder, et cetera. And what it really is, is those the emotional symptoms we're seeing require some skill building, some interventions to deal with and not be resistant to stress so that whatever that emotional space a student might be in can pass, right? We hear so much about suppressing those feelings or denying them. It's like, well, what if you had the tools to be able to deal with it? And, and, and I love this word in schools, and I know y'all use it all the time, but this idea of resiliency and building resiliency to overcome those things and that therapy is not forever. It's let me teach you what you need in order to be resilient, and then on your way you go, and we're happy to, to say goodbye. So really removing the stigma of going and seeking out that other help, and I think teachers can and counselors and people on campus can really help do that. And just the reminder that mental health is health. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ernest, thank you for your patience. Um, and, you know, I think incredible um, ideas and concepts that Juan and Jillian are sharing. But um, at the end of the day, a lot of schools may not have the funding or the budgets. Um, we know that COVID relief funding is in its final year. And so as a former district leader, um, how can you advise others on how they can be thinking about um, funding these school-based mental health programs to make sure that they're sustainable and can continue to be provided at no cost to families. Absolutely, Emily. Uh, let, let me say that um, I believe most school districts, most school leaders, uh, school district leaders have been preparing for this moment for some time. Um, knowing that the uh, funding cliff uh, is approaching September of 2024, and I think you'll see uh, beginning with this uh, upcoming uh, school year, the budget process that will get underway towards the end of this year, early part of uh, 2024, uh, you'll see districts begin to prioritize even more in their uh, operating budget, um, mental health supports uh, for our students and for our staffs. And I think uh, Juan and Jillian nailed it in talking about, you know, it's important when we talk about doing what's best for kids, we have to remember those uh, professionals uh, who have a responsibility and a privilege uh, to take care of our kids. And we need to take care of the professionals um, who do that on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, there are a number of um, strategies that I think uh, school leaders uh, should consider uh, when thinking about how to sustain uh, school-based uh, mental health uh, programs and services for our students. Um, the first um, idea or recommendation that I would put out there is around diversifying uh, our funding sources. And so obviously with the uh, ESSER uh, federal COVID dollars evaporating uh, in about a year, uh, school leaders uh, would be well served to begin to think about uh, or continue to think about how do we diversify our funding sources and what does that look like? That looks like a number of different sources. Uh, that includes uh, grants, uh, particularly grants from uh, private uh, foundations, uh, philanthropic organizations, uh, also uh, referencing uh, government uh, funding. Uh, at the state and local level. Uh, I imagine that uh, districts, uh, let's just say here in North Carolina for the sake of this particular point, uh, come this next budget cycle, there are going to be districts that are going to be clamoring uh, for those uh, funds to continue to address students' uh, mental health needs. Um, I also think partnerships is a key funding source that we, have to explore. Uh, and when I talk about partnerships, I'm thinking about partnerships uh, with our 
uh, community, our business community, our faith community, uh, also our philanthropic community. Uh, this is a community issue. And uh, I know that uh, uh, our hardworking uh, staff in our schools are not naive to think that or believe that we should tackle this um, crisis alone. And so we need everybody at the table. It, it has to be all hands on deck. Uh, and, and speaking of partnerships, I'd just like to lift up uh, a particular type of partnership, uh, which is uh, insurance cost sharing, uh, where schools partner uh, with insurance companies uh, to share the cost for mental health services. Uh, and so uh, it can look different from school district to school district based on the specific needs in that particular district and community. Uh, but that's one, uh, another specific type of partnership. I would also um, say that we have to make sure, uh, point two, we have to make sure that we make mental health services an integral part of our school culture. It has to be uh, front and center, a fundamental part of what we do. Uh, it cannot, uh, it should not uh, be an add-on or be viewed as an add-on, uh, something that, you know, could we do without? Uh, it's got to be weaved into the culture um, of the work that we do every day. And then finally, I would say that uh, we as uh, school leaders, we have to use uh, data-driven results. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, data-driven instruction, uh, we also have to talk about data um, from the standpoint of using the data to show how effective uh, the mental health services that we currently provide are. And the reason that's important uh, is because funders want to see um, how impactful uh, these services have been. They're more inclined to fund uh, mental health services when you can show uh, through the data uh, this has been the impact uh, on our student and our staff populations. Uh, and so uh, I think there are a number of different strategies that school leaders uh, can employ in terms of thinking about how do we sustain these very important uh, mental health services. Wow, you just dropped a lot of uh, very incredible knowledge uh, to for other districts to model. Um, you know, I love how you talk about that this is a community issue. Um, and Jillian, I've heard you talk a lot about the importance of family involvement in the mental health support that students receive at school. And um, Leisha, uh, who is joining us today, talked uh, mentioned in the chat. Um, that you know part of the challenge is that we need a holistic approach and parents often don't know what's happening with their kids and they only find out about it when it's a crisis situation um so jillian i'd love to hear how you at boston public schools takes a holistic approach um, to really involving families uh, in the care of these kids yeah i mean it's it's incredibly important that as we start to build relationships with our students, um, we have to make sure that we're also actively reaching out to parents. Um, we, you know, I often say to people, no soft knocks, right? Like not the, just the barely knocking and, oh, nobody was home. It's the hard knock. It's the, I'm here to help. Um, it's not, I just got voicemail or I sent an email. Um, we need to really engage our parents. And, you know, it, it can be difficult, um, but some of this may mean that we're shifting times of open houses um, to better meet when parents can do it, or we're even shifting the location of open houses or having satellite open houses, um, utilizing community centers to have drop-ins for parents that might be easier for them to get to. Um, other things, um, might mean shifting office hours, that teachers shift times that they're available for parents to reach out. 
We have to ensure that communication with our parents is not just reactionary. We have to make sure that we're doing the proactive calling as well. Parents, you know, I, I'm a parent of school age children and I don't want to just get the call when my kid does something wrong. I love to hear about when my kid does something right too. All parents want to hear that. Um, and that helps to build the relationship. So I think, you know, that's, that's a great way um, to engage parents. Um, and it also builds sort of the foundation for us to have these conversations about mental health. When the relationship already exists, it's easier to start to have those harder conversations. The trust is already there. Um, they're really, relationships are fundamental um, in offering support and engaging families in otherwise hard to reach resources. I mean, another thing that I wanna point out that access to quality healthcare, and like I said earlier, mental health is health. Access to quality healthcare is not equitable. Um, we know this. And um, so we have to work collaboratively with city and state and community-based agencies to ensure that we're wrapping around our young people and their families um, in terms of access to education, specifically education regarding mental health um, and the access to the resources um, th that, that are needed. Um, I think that, you know, we often... Um, I, it's an interesting, you know, and I was thinking about this when Ernest was speaking. The pandemic has really shown a light on mental health and its role in schools. And I think prior to the pandemic, it was easier for educational institutions to solely focus or not solely focus, but primarily focus on teaching and learning. We understand that's what schools do. That's what educational institutions do. But we're also now understanding um, that kids can't learn if they don't feel safe, if they don't feel supported, if their basic needs are not being met. Um, so, you know, it's the hierarchy of needs, right? So in order for our students to come in and be successful in the classroom, we have to meet their other needs as well. And this is a time when student support, when mental health practitioners are really having a light shown upon them in a different way than it was prior to the pandemic. So, you know, we have this time right now, this moment where we can sort of start to shift how we're supporting students and families in our school and what that looks like. And we know at the crux of that um, is, is relationship, both with parents and with students. Um, we have to work together. You know, we can't do this alone. Um, you know, this was said earlier, this is, this is, this is a village approach, right? This is not just, we know that our kids, when they come into us in the morning, all their problems that happened outside of school don't just magically vanish, right? They come into school with issues. They go back home with issues. So the supports have to extend beyond the walls of our school buildings. And in order for that to happen, we have to really connect um, with our allies. And those are parents, those are community members, um, service providers, um, at, at every level, at the state level, um, at the city level, and at the community level. Absolutely. Absolutely. As Ernest said earlier, it's definitely a community issue. And I love how you talked about really this whole child health, um, you know, their mental health, their physical health, um, and how it's so incredibly important to start to destigmatize this concept of mental health um, with families as well, so that they are you know, partners and collaborators in, um, you know, providing the best care for their kids. Juan, we said we'd come back to this, so I am staying true to my promise. Um, students aren't the only ones struggling right now. Um, school staff has been through a lot. Um, most of them are dealing with staff shortages, and they've experienced a lot of trauma in the past few years. So how can districts approach supporting their staff's mental health um, so that they are able to then support their students? You're on mute, Juan. Yeah, sorry, first time on Zoom here. Um, so I'm really glad that we came back around to the topic because it, it is incredibly important. Um, and, and I think it's 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 one of those, and, and you know, we, we have to be able to have staff have the resources to take care of themselves before they can really focus on others. But I also love this approach of, 
of we we if we equip them with the right tools and don't expect staff to solve all these problems. And Jillian and Ernest are really talking about all these other community resources that exist. But where I really like to start with with staff is similar to students. Let's talk with our staff members. What's not going well? Where do you need resources? And I think by identifying what are the biggest pain points for educators right now in our schools? What are the hardest things for them to do? And when you can identify, and uh, uh, more recently, I, I have children myself, and this school drop-off pickup was a nightmare. It was over an hour for some parents to get their kids. Huge pain point. That told us, we need to do something about this. I'm going to bring up a more sensitive topic, the idea of suicide. Suicide is on the, is on the rise in our, in our country and in our schools, and it's a huge topic. But for a lot of staff members, that's a really difficult thing to talk about. In fact, it's something, you know, we talk about a soft knock. Oh, my gosh, I don't want to address it. So, again, it's resources to help educators point them in the direction or to have the conversations. But similarly, when we're dealing with teachers' mental health, as administrators, as, as a, you know, a community resource for schools, I want to be able to have that conversation with those teachers as well. What is difficult for you? How can we develop trainings? You know, at Daybreak, we have over 50 different classes for parents, for educators, for, for teachers to talk about mental health 101, to talk about intervening, but also to talk about self-care. What are you doing as a, as a staff to process your own emotions or your own difficulties? Because we're good at identifying like, boy, teachers need help. Okay, why? Where? Can we get those resources? And I think it really starts with having the, con the, the conversation with administrators and polling and being willing to have those difficult conversations about what's difficult for you in your role and how can I help you? And it might be a resource. It might be a call to action or it might be teaching a skill. You know, it's like, oh, it's really overwhelming. It sounds like we might benefit from teaching some a calming technique. And imagine an educator who identified that, you know, there's a lot of stress in the day and teaching that educator and giving them access to ways to deal with their own stress levels and them having them model it for their students. You really start to talk about some really powerful interventions. And the sad part is we know 60% of teachers considered leaving their job for the private sector because of burnout. Burnout's a real issue. How do we give teachers resources or respite or the rest that they might need? And when we're dealing with it uh, amongst our larger group, the nice part is, you know, as Ernest put, you can make that part of your school community to deal with how do we how do we calm ourselves when we're feeling overwhelmed? What do I do as an educator or as a parent when I'm feeling overwhelmed? I reach out for help. I get those schools. So I really think it's important we, we dig into the resources, we help teachers prioritize their own needs, and we can focus on prof professional development opportunities that prioritize self-care and mindfulness. And I, I love the word mindfulness. I'm sorry, I'm going to go off on a tangent. I can't help it up because I'm a therapist. But the idea of what is mindfulness? Why does that work? Like Because I've worked with young men all the time. Like no, I'm not going to deep breathe. No, it's like Mindfulness gets you away from the emotional center of your brain and using your executive functioning where we can start to problem solve. So we need to be talking about mindfulness and why it works and educate educators on it so then they can spread, you know, spread that, that, that positive skill to help themselves, to help their students, and, and as Ernest put it, to help their entire community. And then finally, I had another point about this idea of, of, of addressing the school's environment to feel positive, safe, and reinforced decision-making. So I just really want to hammer home the idea that uh, some of my colleagues here have already mentioned of making those things part of day-to-day, -day, whether it's math class, English class, social studies. There's always a time to cope with our resistance to what's happening. I don't want the test, Mr. Trevino. Well, what if I gave you the skills to study and be prepared for that test? What if I taught you how your mental health can positively impact you to help you reach your full potential as a student? And that's what we've been talking about, right? The importance of mental health and full potential. And what do I need in order to thrive in that setting? And our, our teachers are going to answer those same questions. What do you need in order to thrive? What skill don't we have? What resource do we need? to deal with this particular situation. And we know that the situation that educators are dealing with is overwhelming. And I believe that having a really strong pulse on what they're dealing with is the start of implementing interventions at a school-wide level, at an individual level. And it all starts similarly with students, with educators on building that relationship to meet those needs so we can truly get that information. We have some wonderful resources now to be able to access. 
telehealth. That's what we do. We have, you know, all these qualified clinicians that are spread out all over the country, right? That are accessible to every child in their living room, right? So it's truly, we're at a time where there's more stress, but there's also more resources that could be available to schools. And, and that's a big part of the mission. Thank you so much, Juan. Um, it's so incredibly important that we are supporting um, these incredible staff members who are, you know, they're supporting uh, our kids every day. I know I am so incredibly thankful uh, for all of the teachers um, that my kids interact with every day. Um, Jillian, chronic absenteeism is something that we're hearing a lot about, and um, it's become a massive challenge uh, in the aftermath of the pandemic. Um, one study I saw found that the number of public school students who are chronically absent has doubled in the past four years. And, you know, clearly youth mental health is playing a major role in that. Um, how can districts help children and really their families who are struggling to get to school every single day? So again, I know I've said it so many times, but this is about those relationships. Um, in order to understand what our st students need, we need to know our students. Anxiety, depression, and other mental health issues have increased dramatically. Um, and this is telling us that we need to increase student access to mental health and resources, and also doing regular screenings for our students. Um, I also think that we have to be able to get out into our communities. Um, doing home visits is a, a focus for Boston Public, for our students that are chronically absent. Um, making sure that, you know, families can lay eyes on us, just like we want to lay eyes on them, um, and interacting with them and asking what they need. Um, it's also, I mean, this is really about getting down and doing the dirt, like the, you know, just getting into the work of creating support plans, progress, monitoring those support plans, ensuring that, um, you know, student voice is in the support plan as well as family voice. We can't create a plan for a student without having any input from the student and the family, right? And we have to create access points for our families. Um, and, and that this is a great place to do it. Um, who better to tell us about the needs of the students that we're serving than their family members? They know them best and we have to give them voice and value that voice. Once students and families, I think, start to fear, feel more valued, they begin to feel safer. They begin to feel that the relationship is authentic. Um, and then supports and resources that are offered are, they feel that they will be delivered, right? Because there's always this fear of like, oh, the school told me this, but I don't think they're going to follow through on it. So, you know, there is some onus on the school district to prove to families and students that we really, we really will follow through. Um, we are listening to their voice. Their voice is important. We want to meet their needs and we want to do it collaboratively. Um, we also have, we increased our numbers of supervisors of attendance this year um, in Boston Public to help with this. We also established new positions, community connection coordinators that will help doing home visits and being out in communities because that piece is so critically important. Um, you know, students that, some students might be at home, right? But then there's other students who leave home every morning and they don't come to school. So finding out where those students are, creating that rapport with them to engage them, ask them what they need at school, why are their needs not being met? And also understanding that, I mean, in Boston, we have approximately 126 schools. So, you know, not every school is for every student. So we have to understand the unique needs of each student and how we can serve them best in an educational setting. And that means, um, you know, differentiated instruction, creating different pathways for students to graduate, um, allowing, you know, we have some, we have Log On, which is one of our alternative ed schools that um, does a lot of hybrid learning. We do require students to come in um, a couple days a week for that, um, because we do understand the importance of students actually coming into the building and making contact with their teacher for some project-based learning. But we have to be creative um, in meeting the educational and academic needs of our students and their mental health needs. So we are very much more aware that educational plans have to also um, have those mental health supports built into them as well. 
Thank you so much for that. Um, I love your approach of taking, um, of having multiple access points um, to these students and their families. Um, also loved your point about regular screenings because I think it's critically important to, you know, try and uncover some of those needs earlier um, before they get to a crisis situation and regular screenings um, really allows uh, you to do some of that like preemptive um, preventative work as well. Ernest, um, how can we institutionalize a mentally healthy culture in our schools and in the broader community? Would love to hear your thoughts on that. A great question, Emily. Um, and if I could, uh, both Juan and Jillian touched on a number of great points. And uh, as I often do, so I don't lose my train of thought, I took copious notes. Uh, and and I, I just wanted to build on, just if I could, Emily, a couple of the points that you all made. Um, you know, Jillian, you talked about being creative, thinking outside of the box. And so I think back to one of the strategies uh, that we used uh, during the pandemic uh, for staff. And so during our monthly leadership meeting uh, with over uh, 400 uh, school-based and district leaders, we brought in a yoga instructor. I know this is unorthodox. I know it is. Uh, I don't care. My, my, my leaders were telling me um, they, they, they needed a break. Uh, they, needed to, they needed to experience something different, break away from the norm. So uh, we started the uh, leadership meeting off with a yoga instructor working on mindfulness. And yes, I did it too. Um, and uh, the feedback that we received afterwards was amazing. Um, another thing that I did every year, um, and, and I can't take credit for this, I, one of my predecessors um, uh, shared this uh, idea and uh, I borrowed it, as we do in education, we borrow ideas. Um, I, at a leadership meeting, I told all of our leaders, I want you to make a doctor's appointment. And I want you to follow through on that appointment, because a lot of times we make the appointments, and I'm guilty of it. Uh, we'll cancel it. Uh, we'll put it on the back burner because something pressing is, is in front of us right now. But I told all of our principals that I want you, whether it's uh, whatever type of doctor or specialist you needed to see, um, you have to make that time to go and make sure your well-being is intact. And, and I said, I said, look, if your supervisor has an issue with it, uh, just have them speak with me. It was that important that they made time for themselves to take care of themselves. Um, the other thing, uh, Jillian, you talked about um, giving students voice. And uh, one of the things that I always told staff was, guys, we got to do things with our kids, not to them. And so when I think about giving them voice and giving them agency, making them feel part of the solution, um, we, we have to do that. We cannot bypass kids. Too often we try to, as adults, uh, try to figure out, well, what's wrong? And, and, and how do we go about addressing these kid issues? We've got to bring kids into the conversation. And it cannot just be our high flyers, which we, 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 we have this uh, tendency to do all the time. We've got, to, we've got to talk to kids along the spectrum, right? So we, we've got to talk to all kids. Uh, and it's got to be diverse. And I'm not just talking about racially or ethnically diverse. Uh, but we know our students are way more diverse than just their race and their ethnicity. That's an important part of their diversity. Um, okay, I think I should probably answer your question, Emily, um, before I get off on a tangent. Um, so, uh, Jillian, you talked about we've got to uh, get rid of this stigma. We, <laughs> I tell you, that feels like a load, a weight that's on, on, on all of our backs, the stigma that's attached to mental health and getting the services and the help and the support that we need. And let me give you two quick examples. I was at a conference um, a couple of months ago um, 
at a university here in North Carolina, and it was a group of um, uh, superintendents and, and other educational officials in K-12 education. And um, our guest speaker for the day, who's a former superintendent um, and uh, works for, uh, uh, he has his own consulting firm. Uh, just, he's doing well. And I tell you that because he left his superintendency on his own terms, but there was some backlash uh, when he left that position. Uh, and uh, it, it was a tough time for him. And I asked him the question. I said, well, how did you deal with that when you left the superintendency? And before I could like literally get the words, I, my, my question now, he said, I went and I sought counsel. And this was an African, a former African-American superintendent. And I point that out because even particularly within African-American community, there's this really uh, stigma that exists about seeking mental health services. And so I applaud him for that. I'm gonna give you another example. I'm doing some work uh, with the school in North Carolina um, and uh, was talking to the principal of this elementary school about a particular child who had some obvious signs of uh, needing some uh, mental health supports. And I asked the principal, I said, well, why isn't the child getting the supports that, that uh, he needs? And the principal shared with me that mom has been contacted multiple times. Uh, the schools have made recommendations, referrals for services. Mom shared with the school officials, my son doesn't have a problem. We've got to get out of this denial state. We've got to get out of the denial state. And we've got to, we've got to address this. Um, you know, everyone wants to think it's, it's not my child. It's not my child. It can be your child. Secondly, uh, and this has already been talked about, so I won't spend a lot of time here. We have to train our staff who interact with students on a daily basis how to address this issue. Remember, educators, teachers did not go to school to become counselors or psychologists or social workers. They went to school to teach, many of them. But we also have lateral entry teachers who enter the profession through another um, career path. And so the onus is on us to make sure that they know how to deal with these challenges and issues when they arise. And then last, um, Jillian, you talked about engaging parents. <laughs> and we have to encourage our parents to support their child's well-being. We have to. And I believe, I believe that all parents want what's best for their kids. I also believe that not all parents know how to address the matter. And you all know that, that adage that says, when you know better, you do better. We have to help equip our families. I wish there was more that we could do um, as school districts to help our families in this particular area. Um, we've, got a, we've got a lot of work to do. And I'll pause there. Ernest, thank you so much. Um, so incredibly important to educate um, the community and families and like you said, equip them with the, you know, knowledge um, about how, you know, improving their child's mental health can really help them to succeed um, in both school and even beyond in life as well. Um, and, and you also mentioned uh, training staff also so incredibly important. Um, Christy uh, asked a question for our panelists and, you know, she says that she wants to be with students in the classroom and individually. She wa doesn't want to be spending her time writing grants and asking the community for money. Um, so who's going to help to find this funding um, that these districts can leverage for their students and staff? 
Okay. And I'll open that up. You guys mind if I take a quick, quick, I trust. I was me. waiting for you. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so we were fortunate and I realized that uh, not all districts, uh, particularly smaller districts, um, have staff members who specialize in particular areas. Uh, but in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools, uh, we were fortunate to have a community partnerships uh, department and family engagement team. Uh, we also had a grants team that could write, seek out those grants, uh, work with school leaders uh, to, to submit grants to meet their needs. Uh, so, you know, we did have uh, specialized staff members uh, for those particular areas. Uh, if your district, and I, I again recognize that not all districts have those resources, um, that's where you know your your philanthropic and your business community come in. You know when business leaders say, "What can I do to help?" <laughs> You've got a responsibility to say, "These are some specific strategic ways that you can help." And, 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 and as we do, and happens in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools, have phenomenal partnerships uh, with uh, Bank of America, uh, Truist Bank. I mean, I, I can go on and on, and I, I know I'll leave someone out, uh, but I know that uh, many of the uh, businesses uh, here are loaning staff to the school district who specialize in those uh, particular areas uh, where we just don't have uh, capacity to help address some of those issues. Thank you so much, Jillian. Is there anything you would add or? Yeah, I mean, similarly in Boston, um, we have a department that supports with grants, but, you know, we also often will um, do cross collaboration around grants that we're applying for. So, um, you know, it sort of lightens the load when it doesn't all live in one department. So social workers working with school psychs, working with special education, working with family liaisons um, and sort of all sitting down and doing it together um, is helpful. And, you know, it, it also provides a space for a little bit of camaraderie, which is always nice, I think, in this in this field of work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if anyone has any questions for our panelists, please add them to the chat. Um, while we wait for those, um, if there are any other like last parting thoughts um, that any of our panelists want to share, uh, please feel free to do that now. Yeah, um, I, I just want to um, piggyback on something that Jillian had mentioned before and, and Ernest as well, the idea of the relationships, uh, building those relationships with families. And just how important it is as a, as a mental health provider, how important it is when 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 a trusted staff member who already has developed that trust and family connection with a family can say, hey, let me introduce you to Juan. Let me introduce you to this program that I know well, or this community partner that provides mental health services, because that kind of a handoff, I think, is, is culturally so important for some families because it's almost like I'm vouching for that person, right? And so, so those relationships go a really far way to, to bridge that gap of, hey, I trust this person. I want to introduce you to them, and they're a resource that you can utilize. Um, and also recognizing that it is difficult for parents at times because there's this emotional connection, right, to to facing the the fact that their their child may be struggling, or you know, if you want to use the word problem. But when when we when we meet with families, we truly develop goals based on what those families need, and those goals are truly driven by uh, by the client by their families and by suggestions from educators. So we really uh, uh, try to partner with schools on that and checking in with schools along that treatment process with the release of information. So for for our work, you know, with, with the clinical team we have at Daybreak, it's incredibly important, not only that, that our referring entities have strong relationships to, to link us, but that we continue uh, that strong relationship. Um, and then if I could, Emily, there was a comment in the chat about, you know, having hands tied and it being really difficult to, because of a state requirement and, and for a school psych doing reports. And I totally know that world having worked in special education. And I, I just think it really speaks to when, when hands are tied and Ernest brought this up with the idea of cost sharing, right? Of like when a school psychs, maybe scope ends because of whatever reason, the scope of practice ends because of uh, an authority, we'll call it. 
I think it's incredibly important to have the resource of a cost sharing or referring to an insurance agency or an outside agency that can then take that that whatever that student dealing with to provide them with the correct resource that can help address those problems when you feel like your hands might be tied. It's like, well, I may not be able to continue down this path for whatever reason, but let me link you with a resource. And that's truly something that we want to be partnering with schools with that Daybreak works with that, that other community agencies and providers can work with so that we can, we can truly pick up from where a, a school psych that knows that case well, we can pick up where you all left off and where you may not be able to go in addressing you know, family issues or family therapy or uh, uh, whatever intervention that th those folks may be needing. So I, I hear you on the frustration and just want you to know that there are more resources uh, available out there and, and to seek them out when necessary. Uh, but but you know that uh, we're here for that, that kind of thing. So I, I just really, really connect with that struggle. We did get um, one question and probably all that we have time for, um, and that is um, someone has a challenge with their supervisor where they focus on academics and they refuse to believe that there are other issues that need to be addressed as well. What is your advice um, around, you know, convincing or or approving um, to other school staff and leaders that um, this should be a priority? I can kick us off, Jillian. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Ernest. So for some, for anyone, and I, I don't, this is not meant in a demeaning way, but for anyone who doesn't believe this is an issue, um, they've got their heads stuck in the sand. Look, I, just last week, um, uh, I mentioned I have two daughters. Uh, my oldest is a sophomore in high school. Just last week, um, one of her middle school classmates who attends another high school, attended another high school, committed suicide. Um, her friends, her friend at that school shared that that was the third suicide since the beginning of the 22-23 school year. This is a problem. It's a crisis. We've got to do something about it. Uh, if we don't do anything now, when are we going to ever do anything? We've got to address it now. Um, and um, the other thing that I, I would lift up is when we talk about partnerships, I failed to mention this earlier, uh, but our uh, colleges and our universities have students majoring in psychology, social work, counseling. We've got to tap that resource as well because we know even in many instances when school districts allot funds for those positions, the, the, the capacity out there to fill those positions, it's just not always there. That pipeline is not there. So we, as, as Jillian said, we've gotta be creative and think outside the box uh, and work with our partners. Thank you so much, Ernest, and thank you all um, for all of your words of wisdom and advice for other districts who are, you know, challenged with some of these um, similar issues that their students and families are facing. Um, for those of you who uh, are still with us, um, please, if you want to learn more about Daybreak, how we partner with districts to um, support uh, their students and staff, um, please let us know. We would love to connect with you. And again, I cannot thank you, Jillian, Ernest, and Juan enough um, for everything you do every day um, to support the mental health needs of students. Thank you so much.